John chapter 1. John 1, verse 37, 38. And the two disciples, that's the disciples of John the Baptist, heard him speak, heard Jesus speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following and said unto them, what seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? We're looking at questions that Jesus asked. Jesus is asking questions, and the real question is, how will you answer those questions? It's not just for them back there. Those questions come to our hearts, don't they? How do you answer? How will I answer whenever he asks me particulars about my life and about my soul? Because it does have to do with eternity. My eternity. Your eternity. Has to do with our fellowship with him. If we're going to walk with him, or walk it out with him. And so we saw three of them this morning, three questions. The first question had to do with Christ himself, Christology. And the question was, who do men say that I am? And who do you say that I am? That's a vital question. Who is Jesus? It's important. There are all kinds of ideas. The world's got all kinds of ideas. We saw some of them. And they're off the wall and they're out of Scripture. Out, away from Scripture, excuse me. And then we ask a second question about forgiveness of sins. The woman taken in adultery. And uh, Jesus asked, where are thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? And then Jesus said, neither do I condemn thee. And so it was about forgiveness, a question that had to do with forgiveness. Then thirdly, Jesus spoke with the Sadducees, Matthew chapter number 23, and he asked them that question about hell. How can ye escape the damnation of hell? That's an important question to answer, isn't it? Now we want to see two more, at least two more questions that I find here. This John chapter 1, we have this fourth question. And it has to do, it's a question about your pursuing. What are you pursuing in life? Jesus asked these two that come to him, what seek ye? What are you hunting after? What is it that you're pursuing in life? What, what are you wanting? They've come to Jesus. Jesus wants to know why they've come to him. Well, the Jews in that first century in Jesus' day, they were looking for Messiah, and largely they were wanting the Messiah to deliver them from the tyranny of Rome so that Israel might be returned to its glory. And that was their mindset. And so Jesus asked them, is this what you're, what are you doing? Why are you coming to me? He wants to know. He wants to know why you are coming. Why are you coming to church? What is it? Why, why are you coming to him? A lot of people come for lots of reasons. And often they're, uh, insignificant reasons. They're not really the primary reason that we must come, and that is that we might get sins forgiven and get right with God and get prepared for eternity. So what, what are you seeking? Who are you seeking? What are you pursuing? People pursue all kinds of things. They, they pursue fame. 
people pursue wealth. They pursue knowledge, comfort and security. People want acceptance more than anything in the world, if I can just get acceptance. People want pleasure. They seek pleasure. They seek peace. Uh, you, know, you know, Hinduism, that's, that's what they're all about. You know why? And I don't blame them for their funny ideology. Their ideology is that, you know, karma kind of ideology. Well, you know, you've lived this way and so you'll pay the consequences in the next life and reincarnation and you keep reincarnating, coming back and if you don't watch out, you come back as low caste and all of that kind of business. Um... And then you know what's the ultimate? I, they're trying yoga and meditation and all. If I can just get some peace. You, you know what the ultimate is? That they die forever. And cease to exist. So I get out of the cycle. <laughs> I'm not interested in that. Are you? <laughs> like, But they're pursuing this nirvana thing. This peace stuff that they're wanting this escapism that they're all about. There are people pursuing all kinds of stuff, aren't they? People want wealth. Even among professed Christians, there are those who want wealth. Jesus didn't pr promise wealth. He said he would supply your needs. Child of God. And yet, there's a whole TV ministry, bunches of them, who, who through the decades here have just pushed and pushed and pushed. Well, if you get right with God, if you'll stay right with God, God's going to give you a bunch of stuff and you're going to have a pile of stuff and you're going to get a, a fat bank account and you're going to get you nice, big, brand new automobiles and some mansions and you're going to be able to have this, that, and something else. And well, I'm sorry... If you've got to remain in semi-poverty, you just must not be right with God. Let me tell you, I know, I know, I know prayer warriors in the mountains of the Appalachians who live nearly dirt poor on Social Security. And they, they're more right with God than any preacher I know. <laughs> you hear me? Jesus said foxes have holes, birds of the nest have a uh, nest, but birds of the air have nest, excuse me. B but said, you, if you're going to follow me, that might be where you're at. The Son of Man doesn't even have a place to lay his head. There's no promise that you're going to be wealthy. God might give you wealth. If, you do, if he does, you'll, all that is is more responsibility on your life because you've got stewardship. You'll give an account about every dime that you, whatever you do. With whatever you got. Everything. You might, you, you might start praying different about wealth. <laughs> so, the Lord wants us to speak, seek spiritual stuff. L listen to this. First, the, that, that's really been the American way. Uh, it's been all about prosperity, hasn't it? First Timothy chapter 6 said, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world. It's certain that we can carry nothing out. Having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. And into many foolish and hurtful lusts. Which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil. It's not money that's the root of all evil. It's the love of it. Wanting it more than anything in the world, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. It brings a lot of sorrow and it'll take you away from God if you don't watch out. If that becomes your, that which I'm going to pursue in life. No amens. Okay. The Lord wants us to seek spiritual stuff. 
Uh, Matt, he asked that, this question, Matthew 16, 26. He said, what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Soul matters are priority. Must be. Our soul, our relationship to God. Spiritual stuff. Not necessarily material stuff. He gives warning about material stuff. Luke 16, verse 13 and 14, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, or you can put in their money. You can't serve both. And the Pharisees, also who were covetous, heard all these things, and then they went on to deride him. So, money's a wonderful servant. It is a brutal master. There are many, many persons, many a millionaire has, has found themselves just tortured, tor uh, absolutely a mess just because they're all about money. The disciples, there's, what are you pursuing? We're still on this point, okay? What are you pursuing? Wealth, uh, power, position. The disciples, what do they do? They want to rule. Give me a position. Matter of fact, that's what mom wanted. Wasn't it? <laughs> well, she came to Jesus and she said, Would you put one of my sons on your right hand and one on your left hand in the kingdom? I, I want them to have positions <laughs> that was what they were that's what she was pursuing but, uh, l let me tell you this mothers will pursue a lot of things for their children daddies will pursue a lot of things for their children that are not necessarily the will of God What are you concerned about? Oh, that they be successful. When we should be primarily concerned that they be spiritual. Right? That they have stuff. That's, that's what my generation did. And my generation and my mom and daddy. The thing was, oh, we didn't ever have anything. We couldn't, we scratched by. We couldn't even get, we, we didn't have anything. You couldn't get, you know, we didn't know whether we had anything to eat by the end of the week. It was just, you know, I'm, am I telling the truth? And so then came along and you, parents wanted their children to have stuff that they didn't have. And so there's, Next thing you know, they're buying stuff all the time and buying stuff and buying stuff. And so then it doesn't make any difference where you go. Oh, I want that $10 thing. <laughs> and, and I want that. And I want that. And I want, You get me? And, and mom and daddies are good, but if we don't watch out, we instilled in them that stuff is what it's all about. And it's not. And if you don't watch out, then they become adults and they still want that $10 thing and that $10,000 thing. <laughs> and, and next thing you know, they go, whoa, whoa, pull on the reins. Get this horse stopped. They don't ever do it. They don't watch out. Because they've never been taught anything about self-restraint when it comes to finances. Pursuing that, that didn't have anything to do with my... What am I doing? Well, something comes to mind, Randy, and I just start in. A grandchild is what came to mind. <laughs> mm. Ruling positions. The, s the disciples wanted to rule. Moms of the disciples wanted them to rule. This little thought. What, what is it about the human psyche that seems to crave ad, adulation and admiration? 
Why do we try to orchestrate the universe so we always come out ahead, even at the expense of those we claim to love? Why is it so hard to be overlooked or to fail to receive the credit for our accomplishments? It is this self-exalting egotism that eats away at the core of our being. It was infused into our DNA the moment we were conceived. And it gnaws away at our souls, desperately clutching at us. Pride seeks to separate us from the very purpose for which we were made. And that is to worship our Creator. Oh, what are you pursuing? What are you pursuing? To worship my Creator. Every waking moment. Oh, no. If you don't watch out, it's about self. Self-promotion. Self-promotion. You know what that is? That's pride. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Luke 18, 19. Everyone that exalts himself shall be abased and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. What are we seeking tonight? What are we seeking? Now, now a passage in Timothy. This is still under the same heading about what we're pursuing pleasures first timothy or second timothy chapter three it goes through a list of things characteristics and traits and all and then verse number four says traitors heady high-minded and here it is lovers of pleasure more than lovers of god there are a lot of people that are just pursuing pleasure. That's what their life is about. Now, let me say, there's nothing wrong with pleasure and pleasures. There is something majorly wrong with loving pleasures more than loving God. That's the issue. That's the problem. Loving anything more than loving God is idolatry. People are obsessed with pleasures. I've got one. Well, I've got more, but I'll tell you one. I love eating. You love eating. It's... It, you say, oh, you eat because you need to. No, you eat because you, no. You like the taste. It just, right? And if I don't watch out, I'll just keep eating. Uh, I'll, eat, I'll eat lunch. I had a marvelous steak today that Bruce Zuloff provided one time. He doesn't even want me to say it. With, with a baked potato and green beans that my bride made ranch some ranch on my top of my baked potato you talk about butter oh, you, oh, you talk about good I wanted ice cream afterwards Ken but I restrained myself but it had been easy for me to go ahead and start in on ice cream two bowls <laughs> three bowls <laughs> you know why because it's pleasurable your tongue just well, how does it say it, Brother Hall? Your tongue just slaps your brain to death or something. Oh, what, what is all that about? <laughs> I wish I knew some of those phrases. I could be a good preacher if I knew some of those phrases. We've got all kinds of pleasures. Entertainment. We, we have a whole world that's about partying. Right? Just whatever gives a kick. Whatever kind of kick 
comes along. The tragedy is Christians waste a lot of time and money on carnal pleasures and kicks that, that have nothing to do with glorifying God. Non-spiritual, you know. Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon Peter, lovest thou me more than these? Might have been talking about the disciples. Do you love me more than you love the disciples? Do you love me more than your fishing business and that, that he had? Because that's what he went back to. Will you love me more? Do you love me preeminently? Jesus said. Do, do you get your heart? Does your heart start racing with thrill? About me, Jesus says. Or, or is the kick all something else? Anything else? And he asked him three times. Lovest thou me? Lovest thou me? Lovest thou me more than these? And then he said, if you love me, do what I told you to do. Put me first, do what I told you to do. So, that's a big question. Well, Jesus said to them, John 1, what seek ye? What am I seeking? What am I pursuing? What am I going for? Is it about glorifying God, whatever it is? Is it about furthering the gospel? And all of us have to confess far too often it's not. Fifth question is in Mark chapter 12, verse number 24. It's a question about knowing God's truth and about God knowing God's power. Knowing God's truth and God's power. Mark 12, 24. Jesus talking to the Sadducees who did not believe in the bodily resurrection of at all, right? Didn't believe in the bodily resurrection. Now you know why they're called Sadducees because they're sad you see. Here's a question. Do ye not therefore err because you know not the scriptures? Neither the power of God. Matthew, no, did I say Matthew? I mean Mark 12, 24. It, do you not therefore err because you know not the scriptures? Do you wander out of the way? Do you go astray because you know not the scriptures? And neither the power of God? That's the question to them. And it's evident. The Sadducees had gone astray, hadn't they? They'd gone away from the truth. They're believing something that is false. And Jesus says there's two things that is the problem here. The two things. He said that the Sadducees were not seeing Scripture, were not seeing correctly because they didn't know their Bible. It's of utmost importance that we know our Bible. And then not only that, they didn't believe in the power of God. Certainly they mustn't have experienced it. Or they'd have believed it. But they don't believe in the power of God. What? Jesus could resurrect somebody from the dead? That's, I mean, don't you think that God has power? Who created it all with spoken word? Couldn't he resurrect somebody? But they apparently didn't believe it. They had a weak God in their mind. And in their mindset. Some survey stuff here. 80% of adults in America own a Bible. 26% have never read the Bible at all. 13% read it several times a week. Only 31% of evangelicals are considered to be 
uh, very knowledgeable about the Bible. So, there are bunches of people who do not know what the Bible say. And yet, you know what you'll find often? They still have strong opinions about it. <laughs> well, they're going to tell you, they, they're going to correct you, they're going to, you know, and they don't know their Bible. You say, give me a chapter, of, well, I don't know where that's at, but I know that's in there. Right? So, we have to know our Bible. We have to know it. That means you have to read it. Not only that, there are people who read it with preconceived notions and ideas and biases. They come with uh, their own slant and they're going to try to interpret the text based on their slant. Sadducees, convinced, no bodily resurrection. So what did they do? Any passage of scripture that they come to, they will bring their bias to it and they will do their dead level best to dismiss the idea. Oh, it might suggest, that verse might suggest that there's bodily resurrection, but I've got to dismiss that and I have to come up with a way to explain that away. People do it all the time. There, there, there's something that's pushed uh, been pushed um, it's called theistic evolution that is oh God created it all but he created by evolutionary process you know there was some kind of big bang or there was a primordial slime that then came up all the way through some little tadpole became a monkey and a monkey became a man you know and and it was billions of years and all those kinds of things. The, the, there are Christians who believe that. Professed Christians who believe that. And so when they come to Genesis chapter number 1, they have to explain all of that away. Oh yeah, the 24-hour period. Oh, we've got to go over to Peter and talk about how the, a day is a thousand years. And so this is talking about 24-hour period and hours. You know, and explain all of that stuff and try to somehow conjured all up that somehow this evolution theory is, is what God did it through evolution. That's not what Genesis 1 says. You have to deny what Genesis 1 says. Why? Because you why are they doing that? They're coming with a bias against. They've already got their mind made up. And so now I'm going to come and I'm going to Look at the verses, and anything that goes contrary to what I want it to say, I'm going to explain it away, dismiss it. I'll come up with an alternative explanation about it. Uh, so, proper approach to the Bible is vital. It's vital. They, they call it exegesis and eisegesis wrong approach you come with this bias and you're going to read into it whatever you can err like the Sadducees did you can go astray from truth wind up in error because you are not scripturally based and because you don't use good sound biblical hermeneutics there are rules for studying the Bible do you know that there are rules for studying anything <laughs> okay I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna read um, a autobiography well I'm gonna read it and read literally what happened in his life and yes he might inject a figure of speech in there uh, that's that's you don't take that part literal because they're figures of speech and language right but everything else you take literal uh, what it says so so we need to know those kinds of rules um, study to show thyself approved 
unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The golden rule for Bible interpretation, we're talking about the Sadducees now, but we're talking about us, is if the plain sense makes common sense, seek no other sense. You read a verse, plain sense, reading a chapter, if plain sense makes sense, don't seek another sense. Don't try to read something into it that's not there. Interpret literally. Interpret culturally. That means you'll have to have some history and some tools. Interpret grammatically. Study the words. Study the language. Interpret contextually. People often, every area, nearly every error in Christendom, false Christendom has come from some kind of one little verse that was taken out of context. Oh, you didn't pay attention to the verses before, the verses after. I just look at what that said. Look at that little statement. And then we build a doctrine on it. Interpret contextually the chapter. What's the chapter saying? What is the book? emphasis that you're reading what and, and what's the rest of the Bible say on the subject too many people try to take one or two verse and they build a whole doctrine on it and yet there are plenty of other verses that talk about the same subject and it says God has a totally different slant than what somebody has gotten out of just the one two verse that means the one two verse you're not interpreting it right Look at what all of the scripture says on that subject. So know the scriptures. Know the power of God. Why? What are we talking about? The question Jesus had, don't err. You'll watch, what, if you don't watch out, you'll get off course. Don't err. I, this thing of the power of God. Um, knowing that God is powerful. And then none of that. Wanting to experience the power of God in your life. All the old Christians wanted to. We should want to. Know the power of God. Power to overcome sin and get victories over sin. Power to read the word of God and it comes alive to you. Power to speak the truth to those we come in contact with. Power to pray and know that God's given you some insurances. Christians tend to land in one of two ditches. They're either all emotional or all academic. They emphasize the power of God. There are those who emphasize the power of God, experiencing the power of God, knowing the power of God. You'll never catch them reading a theological book. Probably. They'll say, oh, oh, that's all just dry religion. I'm not interested in doctrine. <laughs> that's dry religion. Paul talked about them, Romans 10, 2. They have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. I remember when I first got saved, I had a zeal. Man, I made so many people mad trying to get them to God. <laughs> you know what I mean? Huh? And thank God for the heart and the motive and the drive and the emotion. But I need to learn some things. Right? I need to learn some scripture. And then there's the academics. It's uh, all about mental 
mentally having a list of teachings that you agree with? And everybody does. But Jesus warned about it. He said, there are people that draw nigh with their mouth and honor with their lips, but their heart is far from him. And in vain do they worship. Teaching for doctrines, the doctrines of men. That's why, and I've got a pile of books. Don't again, Ken criticized. He came yesterday and said, man, it's worse in this study than it was before. I got a pile of books. But I don't care who I read. I always have a little question mark over all of it. Because they're not infallible. This is. And I know there's a lot of people convinced of a lot of things doctrinally. And I, I believe it's important. There are fundamental doctrines that we must believe that are clearly taught in Scripture. But there are people that make up, you know, well, I go with this crowd, and I go with that crowd, and I go with some other crowd. And if you don't watch out, you just start following everything that they say. Jesus said we're to have both. Enlightened by Scripture and experience the power of God. Are we growing in our knowledge of the Lord, our love for the Lord, and our worship for the Lord. All right. I've got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I got nine more questions. Okay? I'm going to read them to you and we're done. Ready? Ask yourself, apply them. Don't just say, oh, that was those first century folks. They needed to hear that. No, no, we need to hear it. Matthew 9 28, Jesus asked the blind men, Believe ye that I am able to do this? And they said, yes, Lord. And Jesus touched their eyes. And he said, according to your faith, be it unto you. And their eyes were open. Jesus asked us the same question. Believe ye that I am able to do this. Do you believe the Son of God can do, can forgive sins? Do you? Do you believe that he can enable you to do whatever he calls you to do? And told you to do? See? Do you believe he's able? Some people don't believe he's able. Oh, he's not powerful enough to do that. He is. Could he intervene in my financial situation that is sort of messed up? Could he do that? He could. Can he work this thing out? Yes, he can work it out. Can he change all this stuff that's, that I've got rumbling in my heart? Can he? Yeah, he can. He can change you. He's got the power. You say, how in the world would it ever happen? I've got this, that, something else. He can do it to your amazement and you'll give all glory to him because you knew it wasn't you, it was him. Ma uh, Mark, or Matthew 8, 26. Jesus said, why are you so, why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? On the Sea of Galilee, you know. Why are you fearful? That's, he asked us that. Can't you trust me? Even in the storm? I tell you, that particular incident was, is so peculiar. Jesus is in the hinder part of the ship, asleep. And if Jesus is in the ship, you're okay. The ship's not going down. Is it? If Jesus is in your ship... Matthew 12, 48 and 49. Uh, the question was asked, who, who is your brother, your mother, and who is your brethren? That's a good question. Who's Jesus' mother and brother? Is it his biological? No, no. It's spiritual. You get in his family. You can, but as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God. 
Matthew 20, 32. What will you that I do unto you? Jesus said to the blind men. What, what do you want me to do for you? He asked us the same question tonight. What do you want him to do for you? Tell him. He's asking you to tell him. <laughs> That's good news. Matthew 26, 40. What, could you not watch with me for one hour? The Spirit's willing, the flesh is weak. Couldn't you watch and pray? Jesus is asking the same kind of question. Can't, can't you lay in before me with all this stuff? That you got. Luke 6, 46. Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I, I say? Why call me Lord and you don't do what I say? No obedience, no turning from sin, no following Jesus, no surrender to His Lordship. You call me Lord, but... Good question. John 6, 66 and 67. Many of them went away, and then Jesus turned to His own, His closest crowd. And he said, Will you, will ye also go away? You say, Oh, it could never happen. It certainly did with Judas. He's unregenerate. It certainly did with Simon Peter. He went away for a period of time, didn't he? It, you could go away. You say, oh, not me. Yeah, you. I've seen some of God's best go away. Have you? What about David? Man that loved God with all his heart. Wound up off course. Will you also go away? Uh, Luke 18.8. When the Son of Man cometh, will he find faith on the earth? Lots of questions, aren't they? Jesus is asking questions. Jesus is asking questions. And the question tonight is, how will you answer the questions he is asking? Let's stand. There certainly must have been uh, a question that addressed your heart tonight. Talk to him about it. All of those questions. Talk to him about it. What are you pursuing in life? Are you pursuing good and right? Are you pursuing the will of God? Are you endeavoring to glorify God? In all that you're pursuing.
between my soul and the Savior. It couldn't block you from seeing him, the song says. Thank you, Miss Linda. Anybody have a word? Look for the questions in Scripture. Look for them. Um, after, after Adam and Eve sinned, God came walking into the garden and said, Where art thou, Adam? And that's a good question for me and for you. Where am I at exactly in relation to the Savior, in relation to the Sovereign, in relation to sin? Where am I? Anybody? Anybody else? Yes, ma'am.